session. And uh, the first speaker is uh, Sam Noble uh, from Kuzai, and uh, we are very delighted to have her with us. And uh, we are also sending her congratulations to uh, winning the Search Awards UK personalities. That's really, really cool. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so, Sam, uh, please, you are welcome to start with your presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. And um, yeah, thanks ever so much for joining this morning. I want to talk to you about something that's a little bit different when it comes to uh, using paid media to help you basically get your customers to help you grow your business. And whether that is through uh, basically generating customers that buy more from you or whether it's generating customers that like what you're doing and then actually help you to recommend you to others. So when, it, when you think of paid media, so many businesses tend to only focus on paid media to drive actual conversions. whereas I think there's so much more that you can use it for. And I think if you look at a typical conversion funnel, what we typically see is, is people are using paid media for things like driving awareness when it comes to display advertising, uh, consideration and preference. People tend to go down to the route of using um, typical search, paid search ads. And then buying stage is like PLAs, um, Google shopping, that, that kind of thing, coupled with, with search as well. But I think the most important thing to think about is when, when people do consider paid, most people tend to focus on the buying phase and they tend to think, okay, well, I'm going to invest X amount and I want to get X amount in return, which is effectively the right way to think about things. But if you're only thinking about that small slice of, of that funnel, you're missing out on a huge percentage of the market. So as advertisers, what we need to start thinking about is targeting people at every single stage, right from awareness right the way through to loyalty and advocacy. And in this talk, I'm gonna help you try and shift your mindset slightly. Start thinking outside the box. Because if we're thinking about paid media purely from a buy-in perspective, you're missing out on some of your most profitable customers. Now, this is a, a curve graph that's showing you, if you've got, typically got your, your one-time buyers, your first-time buyers, typically businesses will see around a 20% um, of, of their profit comes from those one-time purchases. They then get a really huge percentage of people that come back and buy from them at sort of two or three times. But where you make the biggest amount of profit is from customers that come back time and time again. And the reason that we, we kind of look at things in this way is if you consider how much it actually costs you to acquire a new customer, there was a social um, a study done by Social Annex that basically shows it costs you around 500% more to acquire a new customer than it does to keep a current one. So as advertisers and as business owners, we need to start thinking about our existing customer base and making sure that we're doing amazing stuff for them and offering them sort of discounts and loyalty schemes so that we can try and encourage them to come back from us time and time again. Now, I don't know about you, but people that were doing paid advertising back in the year 2000 when AdWords just launched and going on for, for sort of 10 odd years from there, really, all we really had to target our customers with was, were keywords. We had to upload a load of keywords and then we had to write ad text that then essentially matches the keywords that we're trying to target, which is essentially what we've still got today. But now, as we flash into 2017 and beyond, we've got a lot more that we can get excited by. And the biggest thing, the biggest change that we've seen coming into the paid advertising landscape over the past few years is we can now target our audiences via PPC. And this is where paid funnel targeting gets really, really powerful. The reason it gets powerful is because this is something that your competitors are completely unable to replicate. So if you think of how, how much time and effort you spend in investing in sort of driving traffic through to your website, whether that's from organic, from social, from paid, whatever, whatever medium it is, whether you're doing TV advertising, you're dri driving people through off the back of that, we spend a lot of time and effort trying to generate visitors through to our website. And once you've got that audience there, the most amazing thing that we can now do within paid is we can help them to actually work their way down that purchase funnel. So whether it's that you're driving traffic into the site via a, into a blog post, and then you start doing various things to try and funnel those people that have been interested in a piece of content right the way through to actually buying from you, this is all stuff that we can do within paid. And I think as advertisers, thinking about how we can use our audiences is so important um, and when you consider what, what what we're trying to do when it comes to sort of as business owners we're trying to constantly think about what's our USP what makes us different to our competitors and that in a crowded marketplace is becoming ever ever more difficult and I think 
as we move forward into 2017, I think we need to start thinking about our audience as our UMP. So try and forget about USPs and start thinking about your audience because your audience is your unique marketing point. If I go back to a couple of slides from, from what we were just talking about, your competitors can't replicate that. Like your competitors can't get access to your audience, all of the traffic that you've built up into your website. And I think we need to start making a lot better use of that. And that also comes into play when you're thinking not just about funneling people through from awareness through to purchase and beyond, it's making sure that you're using your audience and you're, you're starting to shift your mindset slightly and you're targeting people and trying to help existing customers grow your business for you and help you recommend to others. So for the next few slides, we're gonna have a quick look at 14 strategies to help you think beyond the conversion. So let's go back to the funnel. I've covered lots of things in previous talks that I've done about how we can help people funnel, way, funnel their way through from awareness right the way through to buy. But we're now gonna focus purely on loyalty and advocacy. So let's start with loyalty. The reason that driving loyalty is important is if you look at this study here, another one done by Social Annex, is that 65% of consumers that they surveyed said that they would actually start um, receiving impact, receiving rewards actually impacts the frequency of how they purchase. So that's if you've got an existing customer and, and you're giving them a, a reward or you're giving them a, a discount from, for coming back, for to, um, coming back and buying from you time and time again, these people are more likely to come back if they do get rewards off the back of this. But more so, 80% of shopping uh, shoppers would actually consider switching stores or brands if they were offered a more compelling discount or promotion. And I think this is becoming ever more um, important when you're, when you're looking at people that are searching online and how people do tend to buy and the buying habits that they've got. People are becoming less loyal to brands and less loyal to businesses. And they're shopping around a lot more and making sure that they're out there to try and get the best possible deal. So it's important that we're making really good use of our existing audiences and trying to help them buy from you time and time again because that's where you're going to get the most profit off the back of that. So let's have a look at eight strategies then to begin with that can help you boost the lifetime value of your customer. The first one is how we can use re remarketing lists for search ads, so RLSAs, so that when somebody is searching, if you've got an existing customer that goes and searches for one of your competitor brand names, you can start displaying adverts to them within search saying, hey, did you know we've got a loyal customer discount here? If you come back and buy from us again, you're gonna get X percent off, a, off an additional service or purchase. You can limit this so you're not just doing blanket competitor advertising um, because if you start doing that, a lot of the time what you tend to find is your quality scores get impacted off the back of PPC and, and people don't necessarily click through. But in this instance, what we're doing is we're going to be uploading either an RLSA list, so a remarketing list and applying it to search, or you upload a list of email addresses of people that have purchased from you in the past. If they then go and search for a competitor, that's when you can then show your advert. The second thing that we can do is we can do remarketing to try and upsell to those customers. So if you've got, let's say for example, you've got a business that sells mobile phones and you've got a list of people that have just gone out and they've just purchased the iPhone 7 as an example. The next possible purchase that that person is gonna likely make is, is potentially gonna be something like an iPhone cover or a phone charger for the car or, or, or something related to that particular model of phone that they've brought. So what you can do in this instance, again, either with a remarketing list or a customer match list, upload all that data so that you know the exact people that have brought that particular model of phone from you or whatever it is that you're trying to market. And then you follow them around with ads, remarketing ads that are trying to cross sell them to make an additional purchase that's relevant to the purchase that they've just made. Thirdly, in a similar way to how remarketing works, you can also do a similar thing with Gmail sponsored promotions. So what Google can do, if you've got a list of your customers that have made a purchase from you before, upload that into, into Gmail, and you can start to say, okay, if Google can match any of the email addresses within that list, so let's say for argument's sake, you upload 2,000 and Google are able to match 1,000 of those, and when I say match 1,000, it means that, that person has to either have a Gmail account or a Google account, YouTube account, anything that is associated to, to Google that helps them identify that you are that individual. When they're looking at their, their emails in Gmail and they're, they're looking through the promotions in the promotions tab, 
or the emails and the promotions tab, your ad can appear at the top. Now, they're already going to have an affinity with you as a brand because they've just made a purchase. So the likelihood of them then wanting to click on an ad, there's, there's more intent in the fact that they may want to do that. So then you can start showing them adverts that are basically trying to upsell them to buy a, an iPhone 7 case because you know that these people have just brought an iPhone from you in the past. Next idea of things that we can do is similar to how we were talking about using remarketing lists for search to show um, ads when, people, when our existing customers are searching for competitors. Do the same thing where you've got a list of your customers, whether it's an RLSA list again or a customer match list. And when those people are searching on Google for any of the other products or services that you sell, you can show a discount in there because you know that they are an existing customer of yours. So you, you can be more, um, you can be a bit more ruthless with the discounts that you're offering. So in this example here, this is just something that I've mocked up that Target could potentially do. We could say, well, we've got 10% off Halloween costumes for loyal customers, use this code at checkout. And I know that that ad is only going to be seen by customers that have made a purchase from me in the past. Next up, using dedicated landing pages for existing customers. I think if you consider, if you were a shop assistant and you've got a customer that's completely brand new to you that you've never met before versus somebody that comes back and they come in and they buy similar products from you once a month, you're going to greet them totally differently to how you would greet a, a brand new customer. You've kind of built that rapport with them. You don't need to necessarily sell, sell to them because they already know what you do as a business. So we should take that same methodology and that same approach and apply that to our online advertising as well. So within AdWords, same way as, the, as what we've been talking about before, where we're using RLSAs or customer match, if you know that an existing customer is searching for an ad and they're coming through to your, your site for a second time from a PPC ad, send them through to a landing page that gives them a, a unique message that's for, her, for them. Make them feel like a loved and valued customer rather than trying to basically put all your USPs and everything in there. Make sure that you're actually showing them something that is relevant to them. And you, you can do this either via your, your custom CMS systems if you've got that flexibility in there, or using third-party tools like Unbounce. Unbounce is great for this, and it comes in at a relatively cheap cost as well. Countdown ads. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen these, but these are the ads that if you if you look at them, they're basically the discount, the time, uh, the timer will count down. And you can do that within weeks, days, hours, and minutes. So this is great if you're doing anything for Black Friday. Um, or any sort of special season discounts that you've got. But this can also work really well if you've had a customer that's been on holiday with you, as an example in this example here, and you want to try and encourage them to do a repeat booking with you, or a second booking. So in this example here, we're saying for Virgin America, let's say somebody's been on holiday with them before, or they've booked a flight with them before, and they've gone to New York. They're then coming back to Google in a subsequent search, and they're trying to then search for flights from, um, to Dallas from New Orleans. So why not say, hey, welcome back from New York City. We, they, we already know that they've been there. Repeat booking deals with Virgin, get a second flight discount. And you get 25% off if you book in the next three days. So countdown ads coupled with RLSA um, lists or customer match lists can be a really great way of driving urgency and trying to push an, a, a discount for a limited time frame. Next up, we've got customer match. Um, with Gmails, with Gmail ads. So if you consider a brand such as Starbucks, for example, where we've got a, um, we've got a list of customers that have been with us before, and we're going to try and promote our loyalty scheme. Customers that are tied into loyalty schemes often come back time and time again, and they become a lot more loyal to a brand because they know that they're going to get something in return for, for doing these repeat purchases. So if you've got a loyalty scheme that you're wanting to push and promote that you may not have launched yet, or you may not have had the uptake that you've been looking for, you can show this to a, a list of email addresses of people that haven't signed up for your loyalty program yet. And when they're doing emails um, on Gmail, in the Promotions tab, they can start to see an advert at the very top that basically is promoting the loyalty scheme for their existing customers. And the last example I've got for loyalty before we move on to advocacy is how we can use um, typical standard search ads to basically promote any reward scheme that we've got. So if you look at this example here for Airbnb, and I've done a simple search for Airbnb loyalty scheme, like people that are searching on Google and on Bing are, are kind of, people are looking for things where they're going to get money off or they're going to make a saving on whatever it is that they're doing. And if you've got a loyalty scheme, 
and somebody is specifically searching for that, whether it's brand plus rewards, brand plus loyalty, brand plus loyalty program, brand plus uh, rewards program, whatever it is they're searching for, you need to make sure that you've got an ad that is related to that particular program. So with their Airbnb here, they do have a loyalty program, but they're not actually pushing that within their ads. And they're really, really missing a trick because what's gonna basically happen is somebody's searching for that, they're gonna go and click onto the points guy there or the American Express site, which is crazy because Airbnb have one. So they wanna try and drive that traffic back through and keep that traffic within their own domain. So to move on to advocacy. Advocacy, if you're considering um, what we can do for, for sort of loyal customers, what we're looking to do here is get our loyal customers, once we've done all this work to try and push them, we want to try and encourage those people to recommend us to other people. And the reason that this is important, if you consider this study here that was done by Bright Lyco, what they're basically saying is 88% of people trust online reviews now, written by other consumers, as much as they trust the recommendations from personal contacts, which is huge, 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 huge. That's 88% of the people that they surveyed. And what's more, 92% of consumers are actually saying that they regularly read online reviews for businesses before they make purchases. So it's getting even more important that as businesses, we need to make sure that we have our loyal customers making recommendations and leaving online reviews for us. So in that same study that we looked at, in, Bright, in the Bright Lycra survey, what they're basically also saying is that 40% of people said that they actually form an opinion reading only one to three reviews. Which is, which is crazy. So people aren't necessarily just digging around. So what we wanna make sure is we've got good reviews coming in from our customers and they're coming in on a, on, a free, on a frequent basis so that we're keeping them up to date. So here's six strategies that we can use to help encourage customers to recommend us to others. First example is using Gmail ads. So if we've got a list of existing customers, upload those into Gmail and you could do something where you can try and promote a forward to a friend scheme. So in this example, um, forward to a friend discount. So in this example here with Deliveroo, they've got a, an offer here that's basically saying forward this on and you can get 10% off your first order. Now, if you're an existing customer of Deliveroo, Deliveroo and you've had a really good experience with them, you'd be more inclined to send that on to, on to friends and try and encourage your friends to then take out that discount as well. So that's one way of doing that. You can also do things where you can try and encourage your existing customers via remarketing to leave online reviews on a, a chosen platform of your choice. So in this example here, I've chosen hotels.com and I've mocked up a few ads. So let's say that they're wanting to push people to, to Trustpilot. Within these ads, you don't drive people through to Trustpilot, you drive people back through to your own domain. But then within there, you've got a landing page that's talking about why you want the reviews. And then from that point onwards, you then push them through to Trustpilot. But you can do this within remarketing ads. So if you've got a list of loyal customers that you wanna follow around, try and encourage them to leave reviews for you in that way. Once you've got the start, once you've got the reviews, what Google then do, once they've chosen, they basically will go to a lots and lots of different uh, review platforms and they will aggregate all of that data. And within your search ads, you then start seeing the star ratings. Now, I don't know about you, but when, I click, when I'm searching for anything on Google and I see something that's got a four or five star rating, my eyes are immediately drawn to that particular ad because I want to kind of click on that versus one that hasn't. So the more online reviews that we can get, and I think we need 120 in a, a 12 month period in order for Google to start aggregating these, these reviews. Um, that's why the frequency and, the, and the, um, the, the volume becomes important. Google will then start automatically showing you these within your, within your paid search ads. Similar to what we were talking about with existing customers, what we need to also make sure is if we're sending any new customers through to the site, our landing pages are basically, covered. we're making sure that we're covering any sort of third party reviews that we've got from our existing customers. So testimonials, star ratings, that kind of stuff. Um, and making sure that you've got those on your landing pages. And I'm seeing the term human to human banded around quite a lot at the moment rather than B2C and B2B. So people are saying, let's think H to H, which seems a bit stupid really, but it's, it's true. I think the more that people say, um, when they're looking at websites and they're seeing reviews on there from other customers and they're seeing positive reviews, people are really influenced by those. Likewise, people are influenced by negative reviews as well. So it's important to make sure that we're considering um, making sure that we've got those on the landing pages for new customers that are coming into the site. 
Next up is again using Gmail ads um, with Customer Match again, but you can use this if you've got any form of a recommend a friend scheme that you want to promote to your existing customers. You can do this within Gmail, same way that, as, as what we've looked at Gmail ads throughout the, the rest of this presentation. But you can use that to basically upload um, an image ad and show them to people that are searching on, that are reading their emails on Gmail, and you can try and promote your recommend a friend scheme and get them to, to basically start joining up that scheme and recommending you to others as well. And the last example that I've got is using Gmail again, um, but this way it's a slightly different way. So if you've got a recommend a friend scheme, you know that, and you've got people that are signing up to that, you know that these type of people are, are kind of looking to get a discount off of something, or they're looking to get something in exchange for, for doing something for you. So what you could do is you could start targeting anybody that is receiving emails from any of the cashback sites, such as Top Cashback, Quid Pro, et cetera. And if they're receiving emails from these domains, then start showing them ads promoting your recommend a friend scheme as well and try and encourage them to sign up and join your scheme as well. For the final section of this presentation, we, I just want to talk to very, very briefly about attribution. And the reason that this is important is if you look at this uh, conversion path here, this, so this is an e-commerce site. And I've basically pulled this off just to give you a, a, an overview and a, a kind of a look and feel for how people tend to search when it comes to, to PPC ads. And this is purely PPC ads. So this is the journey that people have taken. These ads here are our dynamic search ads or remarketing ads. This is campaigns. We've also then here got our standard search network campaigns, followed by Google Shopping, followed by brand. So you can see in these examples how many campaigns an individual person has had to touch, how many times they've actually clicked on a particular ad in a particular campaign before they've come back and converted. So the conversion path for a customer, depending on your business, can be quite long and they can also be quite um, consuming in the fact that they're clicking on paid ads, they could also be clicking on organic, then some social listings, whatever it is that they're doing. So attribution plays a massive part when it comes to PPC. The reason it plays a big part to PPC is when you're looking at a standard PPC report in, in AdWords, the conversion will be attributed to the last ad or the last campaign that was clicked. So in this example, if you look at the top example here, it's a shopping campaign. If I was to sit there and say, well, my brand campaign, which are the red ones, the brand campaign's not working, I'm just gonna switch that off. Now, that assisted and it helped my person that was actually converting on a shopping ad to actually convert. It helped them along their journey. So if you just start switching things off that you don't think are converting, it can really impact the sales at the end of that conversion funnel. So it's important to consider how different campaigns, keywords, and ad groups play a part with each other in order to actually help somebody through that purchase journey before you decide what to switch off. Two last reports that you can look at within here. You can use the assisted, confer assisted conversions report in AdWords to actually see at campaign level the last click conversions, which is what AdWords will typically report on, and also how many click assisted conversions and click assisted value you've had off the back of that as well. And then the report that we were looking at earlier, this is the top pass report, which shows you how many campaigns get clicked and what campaigns get clicked off the back of that. So a couple of final thoughts for you. You work really, really hard to obtain a new customer. Don't make it easy for them to leave you and make sure that you've got your happy customers helping you to gain new ones. Target everybody at every stage of the conversion funnel and remember that your audience is your unique marketing point. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Sam, for your uh, amazing presentation. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, and uh, we will also share your uh, slides with our audience on Twitter soon. And uh, now uh, we are happy to have uh, with us uh, Judith. Uh, so could you please share your slides with our audience now? Hopefully that's, um, hopefully that's about to happen. Yes, yes, okay. great. So we can see it now. And right. uh, we, are, uh, we are going to have actually a very interesting topic and to discuss how to manage different types of uh, promotion. So please, uh, Judith, uh, it's your turn now. 
Thank you very much. Okay, so um, uh, thank you, Sam. That was awesome. I'm going to completely shift gears here from uh, paying for ads to paying people, or, or not, not, not really paying people, but um, I'm going to talk about the difference. So I just want to, I'm wondering because Igor was so shy during the conversation, so I, I'm sure you, you have a couple of things to add. <laughs> well, yeah, so I'm a black hat, so what? Um, this is who I am. You don't care. Um, so uh, links are very important for rankings. That's why we're talking about this. But sometimes people screw things up. Um, and so obviously uh, PR is about relationships, SEOs. Uh, we're all about being nerds mostly, especially if you listen to what was said at the uh, Search Awards dinner the other night. Um, we're all basically nerds. So PR is about relationships, but SEO is about visibility but PR is about visibility too so PRs have tried to start eating the lunch so to speak of SEOs they're, they're trying to to muscle in on our territory sometimes I feel and so um, uh, bloggers and uh, journalists are being targeted by both PRs and SEOs um, and we're both looking at links I mean obviously we want mentions and we want to hear uh, what's uh, what's happening that we can link into for uh, coverage but ultimately we want the link whether it's for traffic or for link building for for visibility we want the links that's that's what we're all about is is basically links so we need to be thinking about uh doing a good job as a pr or as an seo but who actually does the better job of doing outreach prs or seos and of course there are uh, prs that uh, are also seos but there are seos that try to pretend to be prs and I've got some lovely examples of both going wrong. Uh, but sometimes people, and I, I won't I won't lay blame here. Um, uh, I won't I won't put the badness at anyone's front door, despite my personal feelings in the matter. But uh, sometimes people, shall we say, build bad links. Whether you're a PR or an SEO, sometimes you screw it up. This is a, a, a ranking chart from uh, somebody that uh, decided that spamming the universe with links was a good idea. Um, but it wasn't. Uh, as you can clearly see, it's a very bad idea to build bad links because bad links mean that we get um, bad uh, visibility. Uh, nowadays, of course, um, theoretically, uh, bad links should not result in something like this happening. And you can start to see that there was a little bit of a recovery post penguin but um i can say that it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to recover overnight nor does it mean you're actually going to recover everything um you know sometimes prs get outreach wrong especially if they have an seo remit but sometimes they just get it wrong i solicited some fellow bloggers i'm a blogger so i'm on all sorts of secret blogger groups because you know that's what we do <laughs> and uh, i asked some of the other bloggers there what kind of bad approaches they've had um and very interestingly for starters one person said seos can bother to look up my name and address me correctly if they mention money i'm all ears which is which is music to my ears otherwise it's the delete button which of course to a pr is really bad because while as an seo i'm willing to pay for a link and pay for coverage a pr's job is to make somebody want to cover it and not get paid for it so there's really there's a different reason for us to be doing it compared to PRs and of course we now have people who are SEOs who behave in a PR way so if we look at somebody like uh, uh, Verve search you can see from all the awards that they've won in the past one of the reasons they won it is because they acted like a PR agency but in an SEO capacity so that's a really good overlap between the two um, of course, uh, there are SEOs or PRs who do it well, and there are specific Facebook groups that are designed to do nothing else but reach out to bloggers. So uh, if you look for them in Facebook, you will find them. They are places where bloggers go, where they were, will be happy to receive your money in exchange for your content on their site. And as you can see, um, they either solicit by form or they'll solicit directly to have content that's already written, placed on the site. Um, really, it's all about, um, in this case, paying people to get stuff on their site. Again, sometimes it's about not paying in order to get the stuff up there by creating compelling content. But as you can see from what the bloggers are saying, 
it's about money at the end of the day. They want to make money. They have to make money. They're not a journalist. They're not being paid by a newspaper or a magazine. They need to make cash. So in my opinion, SEO is part of online marketing, which includes PR. It's not something that stands alone. It's, it's part and parcel of online marketing. And whether we call ourselves inbound marketers or we call ourselves content marketers or we call ourselves link builders or outreach marketers or whatever the heck we're calling ourselves these days, I really can't keep up. I am old enough now that I'm starting to say, whatever, I can't keep up with you kids anymore. <laughs> it's all part of online marketing as a discipline. So uh, in my opinion, we're all, we're all in the same industry, but we're doing different things. Of course, SEOs screw things up all the time. Oh, excuse my language. SEOs mess things up all the time. Um, and you can see here, there are things like one company asked me to change all my links to follow and remove the disclosure. Disclosure is required by law. Uh, please don't do that, folks. Uh, do do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> um, so please don't ask people to remove disclosure. That's a really bad thing. It, it is actually genuinely against a regulation that's like a law. And so you can get jail time. Um, it, it's a really bad thing to do. Um, and of course, the last one, we were contacted by an SEO wanting links removed, but this one blamed us for the company's penalty. Really? Seriously, it's like blaming the tool and not the craftsman. So please, when you, when you mess up, own up. Um, I buy links, I buy links all the time. I still buy links, I've been buying links for years. There's nothing wrong with buying links if you're doing it for the right reasons. Do not buy a link just to rank better. That's like the suckiest reason that sucked ever from sucking. Um, if you get no traffic from a link, what is the point of that link? And Google has an excellent, excellent um, uh, piece on a reasonable surfer, but also a reasonable clicker. So bloggers are not going to just give you a link for, sh for fun. They're going to give you a link because uh, they want money. It's all about the money. Um, and so the way I pitch things to people is very careful. I actually make sure that I stay within the law I phone my contacts. I also email follow them up. The way that I pitch them is I very specifically KPI them on traffic. That's right. I am not necessarily just looking for a link. I am looking for traffic. And why am I looking for traffic? There's a very specific reason. And there's a reason why there's not a slide on this as well. There's a patent that Google has put out, if I'm remembering correctly, around the reasonable clicker model. Um, so how reasonable would it be to expect my dad, my mom was a programmer, so we can't use my mom, uh, my dad to actually click on a link within an article. So if we go to a blog post and we look at that blog post, how reasonable is it to expect my dad or somebody else's dad or mom or cousin or whatever to click on that link? There's several things that they're going to be looking at and looking for in that link. And that's why I KPI bloggers on traffic. First of all, Google is looking to make sure that the link is actually visible. I've had bloggers give me a link where the link is the same color as the text. No underline, no bold, no nothing. And I said to the blogger, well, um, how is actually anyone going to click on that link if they can't see it? And they said, well, that's the way that my blog template is laid out. Uh, and that's the way it is. So basically, all links on their blog were hidden links. That does me no good because Google assesses that as a, a value-less link. It gives me no value because no one can see it. Now, if I KPI a blogger on traffic, that blogger's going to fail, never work with me again. So I'm very clear on this. If you don't send me traffic, you're not working with me again. Why? Because Google and I need to see that this is a trusty, trusted link. It's a visible link. It's a valuable link. I also recommend to my bloggers that they use language next to the link that actually encourages the click, makes it interesting, makes people want to click it. Um, again, this is something that is looked at as far as the whole context of the link and the article. Is this link something that you would want to click on? What, what's the language usage beforehand? Is it, is it interesting? Is it enticing? Are people going to want to click it? Is it visible? Is it bolded? Is it a different color? Is it a bigger font? I've actually asked bloggers to make it a slightly larger font size and bold. And I've asked it for it to be click here or visit this site now. 
because I am looking to influence that one specific pattern, but also so many other things about links. This is what it's all about. It's about influencing the way, and I've just realized, of course, this is being recorded. Oh, well, um, influencing the way that, that links are perceived. And so if a blogger does not send me any traffic, they never work with me again. If a blogger sends a low amount of traffic, I will contact them during the, the time period of the campaign, and I will work with them to make it a more compelling link. Ultimately, though, really, ultimately, I've been online since 1985. Seriously, in 1994 and 95, the way we found our way around the net was links. There were things like uh, link rings. Gosh, has anybody ever seen one of those? Rings where you like click next and back because they were of a theme. And that theme was the way that you found other websites that were of interest. It was the only way because search engines sucked. And pretty much we're going back to that time. I want a blogger to send my client traffic. I'd like to make some money off of the link placement too. So if it's an e-commerce site and I get a link placed with a blogger, I'd like to get some money. And so that blogger sending me traffic means that I might actually make a sale. Oh my God, placing links for the reason of sales? Whoa, I know, I know. That's a little bit too radical. Let's move on. Um, the law, obviously I have a, a duty and a responsibility to I uh, share with you the EU legislation that underpins the UK 2008 Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Practices. There is also a 2008 Business Protection from Unfair Trading Practices. Both are regulations, both are enshrined in UK law. If you don't believe me, I've got some lovely, lovely links that you can use later for your edification. But trust me, reading the law under legislation.gov.uk is let's say a lengthy process, and you'll need more than just a cup of tea. Um, and possibly you might lose the will to live halfway through. So make sure you have some support there on hand, just in case, you know, let's be safe out there, kids. Uh, but you can also see that bloggers have been given specific guidance from CAP, um, and I know Gus Ferguson worked with them on um, doing the new words on the blog uh, stuff so that, bloggers had better guidance from the ASA around what was and was not allowed. But, you know, I don't want to discourage you from doing outreach. What I want to try to discourage you from doing is buying a link for the sake of buying a link. Ultimately, I would like to discourage you from buying a link for no other reason than buying a link. I know. I know it's radical. I'm a black hat. I'm supposed to just buy links. To, to this, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but uh, can you please uh, shift to the slides? Uh, which are we now on? Because it seems to be on the stable position right now. Really? Yes. Are you, are you seeing people with hands over over? Like... Yes. Now everything is fine. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting you. No worries. That's okay. There, you know, there are links that you've got the slides, of course, on um, SlideShare. So they'll, they'll be up there later. You can see them all and you've got the recording. So, you know, you can try to follow along. <laughs> so people, uh, waffles. Yes, waffles. Waffles are good. <laughs> but outreach. Basically, I'd like to discourage you from buying links uh, just for the purpose of buying links. I want you to buy links because they give you some other benefit, ultimately. Um, I don't want to see anybody buying links for the sake of buying links any longer. And that means that I'd like to see bloggers who hide links not able to make any money anymore because they can't sell their links because no one is clicking. If we all come together and do this together as one, just like the bloggers, we will win. They're always saying that, bloggers. Trust me, I'm in all these groups. So anyway, what we want to do is we want to find our influencers. We want to know who is going to send us traffic that is actually relevant, that we might be able to buy a blog off of, uh, buy a blog, buy a post off of, and get some link juice and, and some love and some traffic and maybe some customers. So I've used BuzzSumo Pro in the past. Obviously, Follower Wonk I used to use because I had a Moz subscription. But hey, we all have to move on with our lives. <laughs> um, so BuzzSumo, um, uh, obviously using the Pro Edition, you can find all sorts of influencers based on a number of different metrics. Um, this was one for a wine tourism search uh, because I was speaking at a wine tourism conference. Uh, I'm going 
there in March and I thought, well, let's look at wine influencers. Um, then I went to SEMrush, one of my favorite tools. Um, I use SEMrush possibly more than I really should. And so I went there to look at what the possible uh, places I could obtain a relevant link from if I was, well, running a wine tourism conference, for example. Um, and so they came up with all of these relevant related sites to the wine tourism conference that I'm speaking at. So it gave me some ideas of where I could possibly get a link placed based on the overlapping keywords with the conference that I was speaking at. But of course you can do this for your own site, your competitor's site, a blog. You could do this for sites about cats, whatever, whatever is your poison. Don't do it for YouTube, it's pointless. But anyway, so we've used BuzzSumo, we've used SEMrush, We've used any one of a number, Inky B, any one of a number of other tools that are out there to find URLs of, of places we might want to get a link placed. Uh, we've done our initial assessment, but I use URL Profiler to scrape or, or to collect all the information and content that I'm interested in in order to um, get a bunch of stats that will be relevant to me in one place. I use Majestic Stats because I want to see what their, their backlink profile is, but I also like Moz because nothing says love like DA and PA, right? Oh yes, you know it. PageRank because I'm old school. No, it's just because sometimes clients like to see it in there. I like social information, but I'm also grabbing their email addresses and their who is information so I can contact them. Google indexation, are they penalized? Um, and SEMrush rank gives me some really interesting stats about organic keywords that the site's ranking for, the estimated organic traffic, and whether or not they're running ads. A site, especially a blog, that is running PPC ads is somebody that I might want to look at more seriously because they're taking their blog more seriously. So I want to make sure that I'm actually doing something with them that, that helps me. Uh, now, obviously, having said that there's nothing like love, uh, and nothing like DNPA, um, auditing your link targets uh, has to be about more than numbers. So yes, I, I'm really interested in the numbers, but I also like to go into Moz sometimes and throw people against the wall and see who sticks. Obviously not literally, because you know, I'm not that evil, <laughs> but I am evil and I accept that, but I'm not evil enough to throw people against the wall. Um, <laughs> I, I also like to go into malls, throw things against the wall, see what sticks. And of course, um, I like to research other sites using Majestic so that I can see who they're getting links from and I can just steal or borrow and be inspired, be inspired by their people that are linking to them and perhaps approach those people since they've linked to my competition to link to me. It's actually one of my favorite techniques because I know if they're already linking to the competition, that they're likely to link to me. Um, so, uh, you know, do your numbers, get your numbers out, get your data out. Um, looking at who else is getting links uh, is a very important thing. So, you know, don't just look at other people, look at your own site because nothing is more annoying to a blogger than actually getting emailed and saying, hi, I'd really like a link off your site. Your site is awesome. I'd like to make your apple recipe that I saw. I literally got this email the other day. This apple recipe that I got here, which was a review of caramel coated apples and how you can actually use a giant apple at home in um, uh, Halloween. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm Canadian, so. Uh, we, we, we love Halloween. Uh, so uh, yes, maybe you want to audit the targets and uh, make sure that you haven't already got a link off of these people before emailing them something pithy and irrelevant, especially when you get all the facts wrong. Uh, um, when you're auditing your links, you can also use Moz. You don't have to just use Majestic. Um, I do love both Moz and Majestic and not just because they start with the letter M. Although the best link tools do seem to, um, <laughs> SEM Rush is coming up quite quickly as well. So SEM Rush can do a lot of good, but the um, the database of links is still a little bit more limited than Moz and, and Majestic. And of course, there's Ahrefs. Um, nothing says love to a client like a line graph, a pie chart, or a bar graph. And SEM Rush is my favorite go-to place when I'm talking to clients about who we should target for links. Um, 
for link for for uh, chart love because I love the charts that SEMrush gives me so easily, so quickly, so cleanly within their interface, and I don't have to have a subscription to use this particular chart tool. So if you just look at the um, the chart comparison tool, it's actually not something that's blocked by subscription, um, or it wasn't the last time I forgot to log on and do this. So it is available to you without having to splash the cash, but using URL profiler with SEMrush does require a subscription, I'm afraid. Um, but, you know, SEMrush is something that I use a ton of if I'm doing link building or just looking after campaigns. So all of that stuff comes together. And then we, I hope you have more than just, we have an awesome product behind you and you're going to be pushing for these bloggers uh, because you actually have a compelling thing, uh, a research report, um, a, a, a new product or innovation that is brand new to the market that is actually revolutionary and not just another color of pink in lipstick. <laughs> yes, got that too. Um, uh, hopefully you've got something that's compelling that's actually meant that you invested time and money or a video. Uh, what I'm about to show you is a graph of um, when link building goes well, but I have to say this was when we had a really compelling piece of content, but it did wasn't just a compelling piece of content. It was pushed out using traditional PR methods. It was pushed out using paid blogger link methods. It was pushed out using a radio day. It was pushed out majorly. And during the extremely lucrative Christmas period, this is a bit old, but during the extremely lucrative Christmas period, we ranked number two or number three for the word loans. Super important for this client. Um, this client has gone on to actually get promoted and go on elsewhere on the back of this, this work. It really, really made a huge difference to them. And you can see here the traffic numbers, the real traffic numbers um, from one period compared to another period. Um, you can see it made a huge difference in their traffic. So um, it, it's absolutely important to have a compelling p reason for bloggers to want to link to you. It's like PR. But for SEO, I know it's crazy. Oh my God. Don't forget, it's all online marketing. So, 10 ideas. Um, be controversial if you can get away with it. Uh, I think that somebody like an innocent smoothies could get away with it. That client could not. Uh, be the font of all knowledge. Uh, do something that uh, is really innovative, research project, whatever. Uh, take a stand. As a blogger, you totally can take a, take a stand. As a business, you have to be very careful about what stand you take. Uh, if you're a personality in a business, you have to be careful. If you're not the CEO, what happens when that person leaves? Um, share or curate content. Um, that's a really good way to gain uh, a lot of links is if you become a place that people can trust to find information. Uh, funny, of course, prolific. Eh, be careful with that because some of us don't like to be spammed by constant information. Uh, mysterious. Everybody loves something mysterious. Ooh, find out more, find out more, start digging. Uh, or most importantly, the really core functional reason why you're building links is that you're offering something unique. Uh, now I know my life is mostly about buying links, but there has to be a reason. So please don't just buy links for links sake. If you take anything away from this talk, it is to actually offer something unique that is compelling and interesting enough for people to link to you without splashing the cash. If you can do that, it becomes easier to buy links, it becomes easier to sell into bloggers, it becomes easier to build those relationships with those bloggers. You only have to do that research two or three times and then you'll have a large database of bloggers willing to work for you or just slap a Google form up there, go into some of the forums and say, hey, I wanna give you some money. Would you like to take my money? And they will sign up. So that's all for me. We're doing questions later. Thank you very much. I've just like completely 
flummoxed everyone clearly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well done, thank you, you Judith very yeah. much for your presentation. It was really great and funny and hilarious. So uh, now we are turning to our last but not the least speaker of the uh, second session and uh, we are happy to introduce you to Alexei Heinz and uh, he is going to uh, uh, to bring you deeper to the issues which we are discussing today. So, Alexei, please, you are welcome to start. Great stuff, guys. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Can you see it moving? It works perfectly, so please, it's your flow now. Great stuff. Well done, guys. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously, thank you to Sam and Judy for talking at uh, different angles of what strategy is, and I guess this is where the academic perspective comes in. I'm uh, totally living in a world uh, that is totally removed from the reality in some ways. But uh, in other ways, uh, in academia, we're always struggling to teach students uh, what strategies and how to make uh, digital marketing work, obviously, because the subject area is so fast moving. So I'm really excited to hear some of the, uh, shall we say, real ideas how to make stuff work. Uh, when it comes to strategy, I think from my point of view, it's important to note that there is a small uh, difference to my understanding what strategy might mean. Uh, generally, um, coming from academic background, so the idea is that a strategy would be something you would be committing your business for a longer term sort of direction for operations. So hopefully, this will be offering people a bit more generic view or conceptual understanding of what strategy might be or how it could work or not. Uh, the reason for this talk is predominantly driven by a number of things. Uh, one of the things that we want to do as academics, obviously, trying to test how good we are with what we are teaching and also practicing. So we actually uh, run several campaigns and as a result of these campaigns, we also submitted them into a number of awards and we've been lucky enough to win them a couple of years ago. We haven't been so lucky to win many this year, but we've been shortlisted and delighted to be part of it. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, in the last couple of months, I've been lucky to uh, join the uh, UK as well as the European Search Awards, as well as the Northern Digitals. And one of the interesting things there is that uh, every single award category has an option to write a strategy. And then all the entrants have to then explain how that strategy or the uh, objectives or the aims uh, uh, have been translated into something that is more tangible. And you know, obviously, as a, somebody who was entering these uh, entries myself, and now as a judge, I can see that there is quite a lot of confusion of what these objectives are and what a good strategy is. And then obviously, trying to see that strategy in a 1,000 word description is a major challenge, as obviously Sam and Judith have, uh, have been judging as well. So they will be able to uh, feed back on some of the reasons of why some entries win and some don't. So good digital marketing strategy, what is it? And uh, this is where we've tried to pull our brains together with uh, a number of uh, universities. We've uh, had five universities around Europe and over 60 industry advisors of how we could help both companies as well as our students to get this exciting topic into one uh, coherent story. So ultimately, the basic idea that we've uh, been able to come up with is that uh, you know, regardless of what industry you're in, regardless of the country that you are based, uh, you will have an organization that has certain uh, objectives. And it was great to hear the first talk today uh, talking about uh, the buyer personas uh, idea. And ultimately, that organization is trying to communicate with a buyer persona and uh, to connect the organization's uh, objectives to the buyer persona, you have centrally uh, the content, which will either be paid for, uh, such as uh, mentioned by Sam, or uh, as also paid for as mentioned by Judy, I believe, and, uh, or perhaps obviously earned or created by yourself. And then obviously you have the multiple channels that you would use. We've mentioned paid, paid, uh, uh, paid PC, uh, organic, uh, PR, any other channels you might be able to, to use. Also, not to forget the real world uh, events or activities that you might be able to, to place in stores and other things that uh, an organization might be involved in. And ultimately, what the benefit of digital channels brings us to is that most of these are coming with data. Although data is not perfect in any of the tools that I've seen so far, 
and several tools contradict each other. But there is a general trend that Google Analytics and the likes will really provide something really useful for us to learn. So the key point to our proposition is that uh, when somebody is trying to think of a, a digital marketing strategy and organization, so this would be in-house or as a client, it would be really, really helpful for us uh, as a, a awards judge to see what, who are the people that you are targeting, what is your business objective of your organization, what kind of content, what channels were used, and what data you were using to judge that particular uh, sort of campaign or uh, operation of that strategy. So to judge all these wonderful things, we like to see smart objectives. And that's, again, uh, another interesting point that I see uh, many times looking at or writing uh, these for award entries, that a smart objective has to be specific. So that means uh, it has uh, some uh, something that we can say it's been achieved or not measurable. So we need to have some kind of quantitative indicator whether we are doing traffic or not obviously achievable and realistic and time bound. So we really want to see sort of a time indicator. Is it year on year uh, growth we are looking for? Is it uh, month on month or any other uh, attribution metrics that you might be able to look at in terms of the successfulness of your strategy? So I guess this is uh, the other thing that we are looking at from the more generic strategy development. So there is not just the marketing things that we need to bear, uh, bear in mind here. It's also sort of general business management things. So for example, a SWOT analysis that comes out of the, of the uh, political, economical, uh, social, technical, legal, and environmental. And then obviously the answer of metrics looking at different uh, products and services that you would have. So what we've come up with here is a very basic A4 sheet. And the, the rule is that you shouldn't be uh, creating any more than one A4 sheet for uh, one of your uh, strategic business objectives. And if you can summarize all your digital marketing strategy activities in one of these A4 sheets, then you're doing pretty well. We've seen some strategies that have been written for 40, 50 pages. And uh, ultimately, the best person who has uh, read it is the person who has actually authored it. The other person who might have approved it uh, might have skim read it. And the reality is it is then uh, sitting somewhere on a hard drive or on a shelf, which uh, isn't uh, going to be used by anybody else. Obviously, we realize you do need to spend a lot of time researching these different things or strategies for organizations. But if you can think of the three uh, strategic points, so for example, the business objectives that you uh, would uh, make clear on, on the left, the buyer personas that you're targeting, the content that you're going to be writing about, channels, is it paid, organic, or whatever else you might be looking at, and then obviously the strategic key keyword research or terms that you might be looking for. And the last but not least is the KPIs to see how these things are working or not. Obviously, any strategy is only as good as the implementation. This is why it's quite useful to have a plan, how this will be uh, uh, paid into uh, put into operation so we've got the option to uh, put out the dates for planning acting observing and when this uh, strategy will be reviewed so the whole idea is that we're mostly working with small and medium-sized enterprises and they like the idea of simplicity so i challenge you all to try and see if this uh, strategy would work for your campaigns or not or if you have an amazing large document, I would also be delighted to hear and see some examples of how you would be approaching a simple strategy communication forward. So uh, when it comes to the assessment of the strategy, and this is something that we have in terms of the reverse engineering idea, we have adopted a, uh, a, a with kind permission, Professor Brian Smith uh, from Pragmatic, uh, 12 questions that will help us to evaluate our strategic planning ideas. So what I'd like you to do now is uh, think about a project or a digital marketing strategy that you might have for your organization or for one of your clients or somebody else and uh, try and play this uh, little uh, quiz. So we have 12 questions. And obviously, by answering this honestly, you will only benefit yourself rather than anybody else. So uh, here we go. So the first question is, uh, is our digital marketing strategy making it clear what markets or parts of the markets we will be concentrating our efforts on? 
So this is going back to the importance of the buyer persona spring and the importance of understanding what the individual is looking for. So as you can see, we've got four answers here. So you've got a digital marketing strategy that attacks all of the market sector equally, uh, which in our case would be uh, uh, equally to zero because uh, in terms of marketing, we'd really need to be a bit more focused. So if the uh, focus is on the descriptor groups, so essentially you have started thinking about uh, buyer personas, then you could score yourself a one. And if your digital marketing strategy attracts uh, uh, needs-based segments, then you would be going for two. And if you haven't got a clue, then you could score yourself as a minus one. So the idea is, if you wanted to reverse engineer this aspect, is that the more your uh, strategy includes needs-based assessment, the higher are the opportunities for you to be more successful. Okay, so we're moving on to question number two. Our digital marketing strategy makes clear what actors uh, fit within, uh, what actions fit within the marketing strategy and what does not. So this is quite important, especially if you have a multi-person uh, team implementing that strategy. So uh, again, the question that we're looking for most is that your marketing strategy or digital strategy makes most of your actions, plans, decisions for you. So that is uh, the point we mentioned earlier. So the importance of stipulating the channels, uh, the keywords we are trying to do, the kind of content we are talking about, and obviously the tone of voice, uh, which might be relevant for us. And again, so if you don't have uh, uh, much constraints, if everybody can do anything they like in terms of implementing the strategy, then obviously that would be a zero. And if you don't know, if your strategy is not able to give you any direction or you are not understanding that, so that uh, chances are it's a minus one. Okay, so the third question is, our digital marketing strategy clearly defines our intended competitive advantage to our buyer personas. And this is uh, going back to Sam's talk about reviews and the importance of reviews to, uh, to others who might be uh, interested in purchasing products from us. So uh, having the, the star ratings or testimonials or case studies from previous uh, uh, visitors is obviously a great way to implement this uh, strategic point but uh, so in the number two is if you can clearly state the reasons the buyer persona should buy from you and not their competitors and substantiate that reason is uh, the ultimately what we are looking for in your strategy implementation again if you don't know minus one if there is no strong support for the reasons your buyer persona should be choosing you that's a zero and if there is a reason, but you have no strong evidence to prove, that's sort of a one. Okay, so I hope you are keeping up with your scoring. And obviously, you are only going to be cheating yourself if you really are not going to give us the honest answers. But I hope that that one is giving you some ideas here. Okay, number four, our digital marketing strategy allows synergy between the activities of the different parts of the organization. And this is quite important, again, to think about the... Uh, need for online and offline collaboration. So especially for those that have a physical presence as well as the online presence. Ideally, the strategy uses best strengths of all departments. So obviously departments doesn't necessarily mean just uh, one team within one organization, but also those who might be on, on uh, you know, in physical contact with individuals and uh, obviously try to synergize the activities and everybody understands what they're trying to do. Well, uh, so we're moving on to number five. Uh, digital marketing strategy is significantly different from that of our competitors for our buyer personas. Uh, again, this is uh, quite a difficult one. Uh, and ultimately, what we're looking for is that you will attack different buyer personas with different value propositions. So different buyer personas could be based on their needs or geographical needs. and uh, the value proposition that you might be offering to them could potentially be uh, somewhat different to that of your competitors. This would be an ideal situation for most of our uh, uh, competitors. And um, uh, this would potentially be the case uh, for um, public sector organizations. Uh, so for example, if there is no competition, that would be something that, uh, and if they are looking at a particular uh, geographic uh, area, that is certainly a competitive advantage for them. Again, uh, if you are attacking the same buyer personas uh, or the same value proposition, that's a zero. 
And if you are able to attack uh, uh, same buyer personas or use the same value propositions, that would be A1. Number six, and uh, a compulsory picture of a cat for everyone. Just to keep you going, we are halfway through. Our digital marketing strategy recognizes and makes full allowance for the needs and wants of our buyer personas. So ultimately, this is going back to the importance of understanding the needs and wants. And we also want to uh, think about needs that aren't just sort of the uh, uh, logical sort of things that you would be able to pick up on the uh, so the, from statistics, we are also looking for emotional and ego needs, things that people don't necessarily want to talk about, but they sort of feel and touchy-feely type of things do make a, a big, uh, uh, interesting uh, sort of uh, persuasive uh, tactic for us. So in this case, I'm using a cat trying to persuade you to keep with me. So that's my emotional uh, opportunity to uh, keep you with us. Okay, uh, number seven, our digital marketing strategy recognizes and makes full allowance for the strategy of our competitors. Uh, not all of our organizations are in the lucky position of public sector where you have the option of uh, no competitors. But uh, you have to bear in mind that if you are buying links or if you are building links, uh, your competitors might be doing something as well. So whenever you are trying to think about your strategy, also try and keep an eye on competitors and integrate some kind of uh, responsive activities where you might be able to pick up on your uh, uh, competitors' uh, activities as well. So ultimately, we're going for number two if you're allowing for the competitors' digital marketing activities. Number eight, our digital marketing strategy recognizes and makes full allowance for the changes in the business environment that are beyond our control, such as technological legislation or social change. So this is a brilliant example for those organizations in the UK. So currently we have something that's called Brexit, uh, which uh, everybody knows it means breakfast. I mean, sorry, Brexit. Uh, and that's about it. So uh, most organizations are having difficulties to plan uh, especially the export and import tactics. So that's a great uh, view of keeping an eye on all these big sort of dis decisions and obviously trying to combine efforts uh, for all the external factors in your strategy would be really, really helpful. And that would be number two. If you uh, don't know minus one and if your strategy is uh, designed for today's conditions, that would be pretty much uh, a zero. So this is quite interesting in terms of the Generation Y in particular consumers that do expect technology pretty much and all the things that they're uh, doing nowadays. So for those businesses that don't cater for those uh, millennials uh, nowadays, they will be struggling in some of the countries with high internet penetration, such as UK, and uh, pretty much sort of uh, uh, growing uh, with most of the other countries as well. Okay, number nine, our digital marketing strategy avoids or compensates for those areas where we are relatively weak compared to our competitors. And ultimately what we're looking for here is your strategy should uh, take, uh, means that your relative weaknesses don't really matter. So the things that you want to focus on are your uh, strengths. Uh, again, if you don't know, that's uh, minus one. And number 10, our digital marketing strategy makes full use of those areas where we are relatively strong compared to our competitors. Again, so we're heading for number two here. If your digital marketing strategy means that your relative strengths become more important, that would be uh, number two. And uh, if you have taken little or no account of your relative strengths, that would be a zero. So essentially, you're missing out a great uh, option there. As uh, Sam mentions, obviously having the positive reviews and then making sure that those are uh, getting uh, sort of mentioned in PPC ads, it's a perfect example of uh, a great opportunity to integrate uh, uh, strategies sort of for the positive things, the strengths of the organization to be helping you uh, to persuade future consumers. Number 11, two to go, guys, uh, nearly there. Our digital marketing strategy, if successfully implemented, will meet all the objectives of the organization. So again, we are going for number two, uh, digital marketing strategy, fully and successfully implemented, deliver, delivers your financial and non-financial objectives. Ultimately, we are not just uh, looking for uh, the financial things that uh, are uh, an organization has far wider sort of remit and we do want to be sustainable. So if we are just uh, looking for making uh, quick wins uh, nowadays, but uh, non long term uh, sort of sustainability of the market, that would be quite difficult as well. And number 12, uh, the last one is the resources available to the organization are sufficient to implement the digital marketing strategy successfully. 
again, so this is something that might be in internal or external to an organization. And uh, if you have both tangible and intangible resources to implement the digital marketing strategy, then obviously you're on the winner and you will be scoring yourself a two. If you don't know minus one, if you have uh, neither tangible nor intangible, that would be a zero. If you have either tangible or intangible, that would be a one. So how did you score? I hope you were able to keep up with the uh, uh, scoring. So ultimately, what we are looking for, and uh, most of our organization that we've done this uh, test previously have uh, had good uh, or uh, well done. Obviously, I'm not sure how honest they have been able to answer these kind of questions. Uh, if you scored uh, uh, 6 to 11, okay, let's hope your competitions are, are very weak. And uh, 6, unless you are uh, literally in the public sector and there is no competition, you would be having a lot of work to uh, ahead uh, to get your organization into some uh, good shape. Right, guys, so to summarize, ultimately what we suggest is that uh, a buyer persona spring can help you to link up your uh, organization's uh, uh, ideas to the uh, buyer personas. So um, making your objective smart, obviously uh, specifying your content, uh, data and the channels and how you're going to be keeping on top of them would be a great uh, way to try and keep up with those. And we hope that uh, this uh, will help you to understand uh, how to make your strategy that bit more successful. So that's uh, me done, guys. <laughs> so if you have any questions. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Alexei, very much for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting, and I think uh, people were happy to try uh, to check their, their their strategies. And now it's time for us to uh, have some questions and answers. And first of all, guys, I'd like to ask if you have some questions to each other. You want us to ask questions of each other? Yeah, if you have questions to each other, maybe you disagree at some point or definitely agree, so it would be nice to hear your opinion about, um, yeah. I have a question to Judith. Okay. <laughs> You've mentioned page rank as one of the indicators. Is page rank still worth uh, uh, sort of losing sleep over? No. <laughs> the only reason I ever whole page rank from URL profiler is because clients want it. I am trying to train them and okay. I'm trying to break the habit. It's like crack or something or chocolate. <laughs> um, but uh, I am trying to break them of the habit of looking at page rank. So that's part of the reason why I provide clients with so many other metrics. And I, I focus them on the ones that really matter. Traffic from organic search, for me, is one of the biggest indicators as to whether a blogger is actually worth working with. If they have no traffic from organic search, why am I working with them? So, pointless. So, I don't, I don't use PageRank. PageRank is pointless. It's worthless. The only reason I'm using it is because clients want it, um, and URL profiler makes it easy to pull. Otherwise, I never want to see it again. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions from you to each other or no? Uh, I don't know. I, th I was looking. So essentially, Sam, I, I was intrigued. You mentioned the 120 reviews is the number that you needed to be in the PPC uh, organic. Is that uh, for the? Is it per month or uh, 120 yeah, reviews? Over, over a 12 month period, Google want to see in order to right. aggregate all of the reviews from the different uh, platforms that they take the data from. You need to have 120 that are going live, basically updated reviews happening every sort of 12 month period. So wow. it's it, that went up, I think it used to be 50 and now it's gone up to 120. I don't know if it's the same for rich snippets within the SEO results, but definitely within paid, that's what they're looking for. Wow, that's, that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Rich snippets within the SEO results, all you have to do is code the sucker oh. on the page. <laughs> <laughs> totally different within paid, but they have to work for this stuff. 100, 120 a year is is pretty substantial, especially if you're a smaller brand that's trying to compete within a, yeah. a certain space. But it's um, whether they're trying to do that so that people aren't necessarily gaming what they're doing. But and it also has to be on sites that Google will actually aggregate that data from. So yeah. if you're in the travel industry, for example, so many customers will leave reviews on TripAdvisor, but that doesn't form part of Google's um, aggregation platform. So they okay. won't look at TripAdvisor and pull in reviews from there. So it's important to look at the sites that they do take 
uh, data from. They do take the reviews from. Make sure that you're using a platform that is recognised by Google. Which it seems mental that they won't do things with TripAdvisor. Seeing there's a lot of travel brands, that's where people will naturally go to. Yeah. But it's uh, it's not available at the moment. That's interesting. I mean, also, if you think of 120 people, it's not just like you have 120 customers. It's no. 120 people who are happy to leave a review. A positive is, review that you're so looking for as well. Ideally, yeah. yes. Uh, it's pretty substantial. <laughs> okay. Great stuff. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, guys. And uh, we have a question to, uh, for you. What do you think? What should be definitely measured? What is a total must for all digital market marketers? Is that to everybody or? Yes, you can give your opinion, uh, each of you, or maybe one of you, as you wish. <laughs> Revenue. Revenue and sales for me. I think when people get fixated on other metrics, especially when it comes to PPC, people say, oh, we've increased your click-through rate, or we've done this to your quality score, whatever else. I think that the biggest metric that you need to look at is what's that actually doing to the bottom line of a business, rather than trying to look at the fluffy stuff that's kind of easier to inflate. Um, it's what's it actually doing for your business and what's the return on what you're investing in a particular channel. I, I'm all for fluffy numbers. I'm, I'm all for just, you know, measuring fluffiness. But uh, Sam is absolutely correct. And that's why I emphasized in my talk that you have to have something worthwhile linking to yeah. and that bloggers have to be sending you traffic because I'd like to make some money off of those links that I play. So um, it, it, at the end of the day, we are in this to make money, not just for ourselves, but for our clients. Mm -hmm. So that's why revenue measurement is so important. So uh, Sam is absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, do, do you not think obviously there are some different campaigns? Uh, Sam will be focusing, say, on uh, obviously PR side of things. So you, you just want to, you know, Sam was talking about the funnel. So you might be looking at people at the far end of the funnel. So you're just doing awareness raising. So obviously, the, if you look at the hard numbers there, it's going to be very difficult. And this is where social media as a channel is struggling a number of times because also when people go on social media, they're not necessarily going to be buying straight away, but you know, they get to know about your brand and they get to speak to you later on. But uh, later on, they might make a purchase uh, coming through a number of different touch points and uh, then they feel more trustworthy of your organization. So. I think it's quite interesting to sort of be very specific with your objectives and uh, obviously see and uh, sort of iterate those as, as you go along and uh, then see what works for your brand as well because it obviously depends on the industry, uh, country, products, services and all sorts of other things that you really can't just take one thing from one person and say it applies to everybody, I don't know. I think, I think with, with that, if you're looking at any channel within, like within Google Analytics, where you can look at the multi-channel funnels and see how different channels interact with each other, yeah. I think even if you're, especially within a PPC or social space, looking yeah. at whether something may not be that last click attribution that you're looking for, but it will definitely, if it, if it's helping something along the way, being able to use the funnels to basically say, okay, well we did a big social campaign here, and that assisted in a conversion maybe six to 12 months down the line, but yeah. we know that that's actually helped somebody actually funnel their way through and it's assisted in that person's journey before they convert. So we, I, I look at that within PPC all the time. If there's campaigns that we're driving awareness, but they don't lead to somebody converting in a X number of day period or week period, then it's then that I start to think, okay, is that awareness campaign right? Because it needs to actually end with something at the end of, of the funnel. Yeah, that's good. For us, it's quite a challenge because a lot of stuff we do, we don't, we, we, we are just in education. We hope to educate the world. So yeah. we have a web page with 100,000 uh, views per month. And that for us, that's great. So it means 100,000 people have visited that page and they've benefited from the content in one way or another. We don't sell anything directly, but we hope obviously that people will come. Uh, to us as a trusted resource as a consequence. So that's quite an interesting sort of. Uh, angle for obviously different industries you might have different KPIs. Different metrics and KPIs, yes. yeah definitely. Yeah. I think from a B2B point of view and I play a lot in the B2B space, yeah. we actually can't Hi, measure Hi, Hi, Paul, as can you hear me? Can I, who are we listening to? What <laughs> Sorry. Oh my god, it's a ghost voice. <laughs> <laughs> that was our Alex. Sorry. Um, uh, it, from a B two B point of view, you actually you get leads, but you can't measure revenue. So yeah. we're looking for things like traffic that ultimately generates leads. And I've actually done programs where the only thing that we were looking for was subscriptions to the newsletter for a B two B company. 
And that seems like one of the hardest things that I've ever done. But subscriptions to the blog newsletter were, was the metric that we were measuring. So obviously in the B2B space, where it's harder to measure direct revenue, you're going to have different KPIs. If you're a blogger, you're going to have different KPIs. You need to do it by vertical. Yeah. Mm. Okay, can, can I ask another question? Uh, yeah, sure. Guys, I mean, obviously, the, uh, I'm intrigued uh, if uh, Judith and Sam were able to follow the uh, self-scoring or self-assessment of their strategies. I don't know, did that make sense or would you mind to reveal what uh, results you got? Yeah, and then just What results we got in campaigns that we've run, or uh, on the you remember the buy and persona spring, the self assessment. I don't know if yeah. you were able to score yourself or some of your campaigns that you were doing. Uh, what, what, while your while your slides were up. Yes. No, I wasn't able to. Oh, do you were oh, oh, no, right. were right. no, no, Yes, no, <laughs> You were allowed to have. I'm happy to do that though, and I'm happy to share the results with you if you'd like. Yeah, that would be really interesting. From our point of view, it's interesting to see how people are, uh, sort of what what the majority of people sort of feel in, in that uh, way. Judith, were you also sort of away? <laughs> I actually did it earlier. I, I went through your slides. Um, I oh, cheated. No. I looked okay. at your slides on SlideShare earlier. I thought it was a really interesting framework. From a strategic point of view, we do so many different things that we don't always go through all of those yeah, stages. Yeah. So I think that obviously some of them I would score, if I was being honest, zero. But as a black hat, I scored 100%. <laughs> hey, very good. <laughs> well, obviously, uh, the idea is just for self evaluation to just see how, how good your strategy is. And one of the things that we find, especially working with larger sort of organizations that have to outsource and work with agencies, and they are, it, it always takes a long time. Obviously, both of you working as agencies in, in so many ways. You know, trying to come into an organization, trying to understand what their business is, takes such a long time. So we thought if there is some common notation or common language to spell things out, what you're looking for, I don't know if that would be helpful for the world, mm. or for the digital marketing the universe in general, or the future of our sanity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for the future of my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Brilliant. No worries. <laughs> I have a question for Sam, if we have time. Yes, I think that could be the last question for now, because uh, okay, we are we running up time, uh, so please. So Sam, uh, the last question is, obviously remarketing, retargeting is really, really important. Uh, retargeting people who have already bought from you um, seems like it must be very difficult for companies, because not only do I get retargeted with stuff I've already bought, which of course is, a, is something's broken there, but yep. I will get retargeted for months and months and months. I'm looking at you, Bravissimo. Um, <laughs> so what recommendations would you make to companies to help them stop doing or you know, committing this heinous crime? I, that's a really simple one. All they need to do is basically, if you've got a list of people that you're trying to remarket to, to encourage them to make a purchase, you then need to have a list of people that gets updated every time somebody makes a purchase and basically just minus that list off of the one that you're trying to target to. Is it so, difficult though? No, it is, it is the biggest bugbear that I see when people are following you around with things that you've already bought. It is the most simple thing to do. It's literally like doing a simple piece of math where you're saying this plus this minus this equals the list you want to target. And so many brands get it wrong and they just completely ignore it. But you can set them up so that they're automatically updated every time somebody makes a purchase and they just automatically go into a bucket. But it's a very, very simple, straightforward thing to do that people typically miss when they're doing any standard remarketing like that. So. It's we, we need you to have like a one minute video thing or a 30 second video yeah. clip that we just email to people. It's simple. It's simple. It's simple. Yeah. I'll just become a gift. That's what I'm yes, going to do. Right. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you very much for your presentations and the wonderful discussion. Thank you for finding time. And uh, we will share, as we promised, your slides with our subscribers on Twitter. So I uh, hope you, to have you still uh, in some other sessions of us. So you're welcome to join your colleagues to listen to them. And have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye. Bye. Yay. Good luck with the train, Judy. <laughs> yeah, good you. luck. Hope you get your train. You got 15 minutes. <laughs>